I'd like to welcome you to our program tonight, Sexual Citizens, a Landmark Study of Sex, Power, and Assault on Campus. And I thank you all very much for being here. For those of you who may not have seen it, there are food and there's food and drink at the back, so I encourage you to take advantage of that. So let me introduce myself first. I'm Amy Fairchild. I'm Dean of the College of Public Health, and I'm a longtime friend and colleague of one of our two authors today, Jennifer Hirsch. She is an anthropologist and a professor of sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University in New York. And Seamus Khan, who is my new friend and new colleague as of last night, who is professor and chair of sociology at Columbia University. Um, the normal thing to do right now is read you a list of all of their accomplishments. I am not going to do that but, uh, because I want, I want their work to speak for itself. And I think that after our time here together, you're going to agree with me that these are two rock stars, and we are so fortunate to have them here. They're intellectual rock stars, but they're also really important public scholars. They're taking their work into public spaces. They were on Ann Fisher's show this morning. Um, and let me introduce Ann Fisher, if you don't know her. We are very fortunate to have her here as our, mo as our moderator for today. She is the host of All Sides with Ann Fisher, our local, always provocative and timely public affairs WOSU radio show. And again, we will be tweeting out that interview. I'm sure WOSU will be tweeting it out too, so I encourage you to, to listen to that because I'm sure we'll cover slightly different ground today. Um, if you look up on our slide here, uh, I want to be sure and call out the list of our co-sponsors um, and underscore the importance of seeing this many units within the institution. So I'd like to thank the, the College of Social Work, uh, in the Provost's Office, the Women's Place, the Office of Outreach and Engagement, the Office of Institutional Equity, uh, the Wexner Center for the Arts, Ohio State Advance, University Libraries, um, the, U the OSU Department of Public Safety, Police Division, and in the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and the Department of Sociology. And I'm reading you this list not just for the sake of naming our co-sponsors, um, but, but to, to underscore what this, this means. Um, it, it tells you something about the importance of the issue, that so many units across campus immediately jumped onto this opportunity and say, yes, we want to be part of it. Um, because this is not a unit for, uh, this is not an issue for one unit to address, one university to address, one, uh, one institution to address, one state to address. Um, sexual assault is not one single problem, it's a multifaceted problem. And this really underscores uh, a broad, cross-cutting campus commitment to not just hosting this event, but to starting uh, and sustaining a conversation. Um, so what you're going to hear tonight is the sexual assault being framed and discussed as a public health problem. Seeing it in this way requires that we shift our focus from um, attention to individuals and thinking about sexual assault as a problem that we need to address encounter by encounter. We have to shift our focus from individuals to systems. Framing sexual assault as a public health problem requires putting high-profile events into, into broad context as well. So we start this conversation here in Columbus at OSU um, in a setting that's marked by distress, ongoing distress, about Richard Strauss uh, and anger over Richard Strauss. We started in a setting involving allegations about two football players uh, and, um, um, and kidnapping and rape. Uh, and you'll hear tonight that the problem of predators, the problem of toxic masculinity, is indeed important to address. It's serious. And it's not the bulk of the problem of sexual assault. As Jennifer and Seamus are going to explain, assault is a predictable element of campus and community life. There's a whole, uh, there's a whole range of, of behaviors and incidents that lie beneath the level of the water that represent the big bolus of the iceberg. So then it's vitally important that we enter into a discussion in an open, candid, and sustained way. Even so, I want to underscore that we're going to be talking uh, explicitly about sexual assault. 
You will hear stories that are personal. You'll hear stories that are emotional. So you should feel free to step out of the room at any point. No one will judge you. No one will be offended. Um, in addition, we have a number of folks here available in the back should anyone need resources. We have Kelly Brennan from the Office of Institutional Equity, Kelly, Kelly Leedy from Counseling and Consultation Services, uh, Emily Gamar from Sexual Assault Response Network of Central Ohio. Thank you all for being here. And as I invite Ann Fisher now to open up and facilitate our discussion, I want to call your attention to the website here. This is going to be open throughout the, the discussion on stage. Please send any questions that you have so that we can make sure that, you, that the things you're thinking of during the discussion can get addressed and that we can, we can begin to um, um, hit on those, those themes that appear most frequently. So at this point, thank you, Ann. Thank you, Seamus. Thank you, Jennifer. And I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things I want to impress upon you, especially students, is that this isn't just about you. Is this sounding okay? Or does it sound weird to you too? It's very loud. Okay. Hello? He's working on it. Anyways. Can you hear me? <laughs> Okay. Oh. Okay, that's better. Can you hear me now? I think my mic is Did you turn it on? My mic is on too, but I don't know. I love it. You know, this just brings us down. <laughs> it just brings us right down to, you know, because back in the olden days you had to yell. So, but I wanted to, you know, my, from reading the book, um, one of the things that I'm feeling from all of this, um, is that it's about, it's a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus. But it's not just about students who are on campus now. This is a generational, a multi-generational approach, I should say, um, to, it, when you talk about systems, you're talking about people at, at all different places in the continuum of human existence right now in our society. So it's about, you know, for students, it's about not just you, but it's about your kids someday and what you're gonna teach your own kids, and um, maybe my grandkids, if I'm ever lucky enough to have them, or anything like that. It's just different than just looking at it from a microcosm, as a microcosm, and, and looking at it more as a macro um, event. So um, thanks for uh, having me, thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, I, and you guys, you, have your, you do your eye things when you see who's gonna answer what question, but certainly, they have a thing. But I wanted to know if we could start with what we mean by landmark and what makes this different. Um, so first I wanna make sure that my mic is on, which I think it's not. And now it's on. Okay, Land what is landmark? Um, What's so, different about this? So uh, there has, when we started the project, there was a lot of attention across America in 2014 to campus sexual assault, but the focus was really on adjudication, on what to do after assaults happen, or on sort of the campus as a hunting ground. So the, note, the idea of a sociopathic perpetrator, perpetrator, people lurking in the bushes. And um, we wanted to do a hard reset on the conversation and think what can we do to prevent assaults from happening? So we reached out to Columbia with the idea and they were supportive. So my friend uh, Claude Ann Mellons, who's a clinical psychologist, and I developed the Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, which was sort of like a moonshot level project. I thought, you know, we cured cancer because a lot of money was invested in research, right? So like, if there were more of a commitment to producing knowledge around what are the social roots of this problem, we could do better at prevention. We brought together a team of eight faculty and nearly 30 people in all, um, and developed a project that had three major components. So there was uh, two kinds of survey research. There was uh, ethnographic research, which is when you spend time talking with and hanging out with uh, undergraduates sort of as they go about the process of their everyday lives. Um, and then because most research, I hate to break it to you, doesn't have a lot of impact on the world, 
Um, and so we, from the beginning, had a substantial community engagement component, which involved having undergraduates work with us in planning and implementing the research and also working with administrators to be in conversation from the very beginning about, about what we would find. And they also helped you formulate your questions and how to talk about this, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, you know, if you want to ask about sexual activity, that words like hookup are very commonly used among young people, but, you know, as a social scientist, like, what does it hookup mean? Um, it could mean a lot of different things. And so figuring out ways to ask about sort of the common practices that people have, but to do so in a scientifically rigorous way was really important. And so they served as kind of this entry point for us into campus life. And, you know, we were, we, our researchers were in fraternity basements and sororities. They were in religious student uh, spaces. They were hanging out in dorm rooms. Um, uh, they were sort of like all throughout campus for hundreds of hours. And, you know, this was also a big difference in our approach, which was trying to think about sex and sexual assault, not from the perspective of that moment of consent, like did consent exist or not in that moment of a sexual interaction, but instead to put it in perspective of the entire world of students. So the aim of the book is really to kind of pull back the curtain on what it's like to be a college student today, and then to use that to try and explain why sexual assault is such a common feature of that. And it, it doesn't just have to do with the process of consent, where you know, if we just had more trainings on consent, we could get rid of this problem. It's interesting, though, because as I was reading it, and I was aware that that's what you had done to create that, you know, not create, but establish the context, I still felt like it was would have been relevant even before back when we used to say hookup was just, you're actually just gonna meet somebody, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, back in the olden days, and it felt relevant to even what I went through 150 years ago. Well, I mean, we all, those of us who are adults, we all grew up, right? And I think that growing up is a process of figuring out what kind of life you wanna be, what kind of life you wanna have, and that includes figuring out what intimacy means to people. We found that so many of the, most of the young people that we spoke with for the work had never had a conversation with an adult about what sex was going to mean to them. I still haven't. With an adult? Would you want to talk? Well, we later? can talk about it right now. <laughs> but I mean, if you if you think if you think about how much work we put into teaching young people how to drive. So there's driver's ed, and there's I'm not sure we need a licensing procedure for sex, but there's speed bumps and road design, and there's a, a sort of the, the, the consummate multi-level intervention that has produced a world in which young people can do what is actually a pretty dangerous thing, right. without, mostly without hurting other people. And so, you know, what I think feels resonant to you is that we're still not having that same kind of social effort around raising young people up in a way that they can um, understand that they have a right to choose the kinds of sex they have and that other people around them have that same right. I also think it's important to confront some misconceptualizations about young people today, you know, particularly the idea that they're sort of sex crazed or hedonic in a way that generations before weren't. I mean, young people today are having less sex than a generation before. And so it, it just simply isn't the case when parents look at their kids and they think like, what is this wild situation that's happening? Actually, you know, they, they were engaging in more sexual activity than the young people today are. And that's, it's really important to sort of remember that. And I think over the course of the project, what Jennifer and I really, like what we developed was a sense of empathy about what it's like to be a young person today, um, where you sort of check your, your presumptions at the door, and this is really the advantage of the kind of perspective that we take, which is our aim is to tell stories from the perspective of the people who, who, who narrated those to us. And that meant telling stories about people and their experiences of assault, but it also meant telling stories about people who committed assaults. And sometimes discovering that that was the case in the process of telling the story. Yeah, I mean, one young man, Austin, um, Austin features in the one really steamy sex scene in the book, which I'm not gonna describe here, sorry, you have to read it. But um, he was, in many ways, he, he seemed like such a sweet young man. He had uh, developed a series of nicknames with his girlfriend for the kinds of orgasms that she had. So he really wanted, he wanted to be a good boyfriend, he the wanted best. to be a good yeah. lover. Um, and he also told us a story in the interview about assaulting uh, a young woman. He, he was very anxious freshman year 
about not having as much sexual experience as he perceived his peers had. Um, late at night, he was in a bedroom. Uh, his roommate's girlfriend's roommate was in that same bedroom. She was drunk and she said to him, I don't want to do anything. And yet he got in bed with her and he started to touch her body. And then he checked himself and he stopped. But that was an assault, right? It was unwanted, non-consensual sexual touching. And it was only in telling us the story that he came to label what he had done as assault. And he was pretty wrecked by it. Um, that moment of realizing that what he had that he had done something wrong because um, he knew it was wrong, and he imagined people who assault to always be terrible people, and so it was hard to put that together with his aspiration for the kind of person he wanted to be. You know, the more I think about it, the more I love the title of the book um, because it's it's a double. It, it's got multiple messages to it. Sexual citizens. It's not only um, you know conferring uh, a status on somebody. Uh, but also conferring responsibility. Absolutely. I mean, the, the idea of sexual citizenship is um, that we as communities have a responsibility to develop in young people, but actually all people, um, uh, their own sense that they have the right to say yes to the kinds of sex that they want and the right to say no. And the right to say yes to sex is actually really important to that. But there's a second part of the, the definition, and that's that the people that they're having sex with have the equivalent right. And so, you know, you have to look at that person in that way. And so many times we heard stories where young people hadn't really developed a sense, a full sense of their own sexual citizenship. You know, we, we, we spoke to one young woman who was very much a part of the kind of club scene of New York. Um, uh, she was beautiful, thin, uh, blonde, and told us, a, you know, like a series of stories about walking in and out of uh, 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 a series of bedrooms with, with kind of B-list actors and not so famous athletes. And she knew that she didn't want to have sex with them. And so her, she fashioned this kind of solution. She sort of said like, well, I just would, you know, give them a blowjob so I could get out of there. And for us, we see that as a fundamental failure of sexual citizenship of two people. Um, the first is the men in those situations who think about the sex that they're having as something to have or to get, rather than something to do with someone else, and not really thinking extensively about the sexual citizenship of the woman that they were with. And then we think about it as a failure of the communities that raised this woman, where rather than have an awkward conversation of being like, I'm not really feeling this and I wanna get out of here, um, the best solution to her was to perform oral sex and walk away. And so you know, we don't think of that experience as an assault. Um, but we do think about it as a failure of sexual citizenship and that that failure can lay the groundwork for other kinds of assault. She was very interesting. Um, well, they all, they all were, but the, the, she was interesting because of the trajectory and where that, the realization and where the experiences led her. She ended up kind of eschewing um, uh, much of a sex life at some point, right? Well, well she, I mean, she, she endured two assaults after that. One, Clear, um, clearly, yeah. Um, in one case, uh, her friends were like, you should try going out with college guys. And she was like, not that into it, but she's like, okay, well, there's one guy who's asking me out, he's a senior, so. Um, and she imagined sort of proceeding slowly around the bases, whatever the bases are, she was gonna move slowly through them. And um, they were back in his room and he was having none of it. And so she convinced him that she would just sleep over and they could cuddle. And then she woke up in the middle of the night and he was humping her leg. And she was like, this is disgusting. And, and so she clearly identified that as an assault. Um, and, but then it wasn't until the second time that she was assaulted, which was a really scary incident of unwanted touching where there was a guy in her room who, um, they had gone to get high together, they were back in her room. He said, I came all this way uptown to smoke you out and I'm not even going to have an orgasm. And she was like, no, actually, you're not going to have an orgasm. Please leave. And, and they had an intense verbal altercation. And eventually he left. And it was that moment after a lot of unwanted sex that was not assault and then two really unpleasant, um, upsetting incidents where she articulated to herself that she didn't owe anyone any sexual pleasure, that she, she was only going to do things that she wanted to do. And our point is really... And I think this is so important to underline. Our point is not to blame her. It's to think about how are we raising young people who are so unclear 
about their own sexual boundaries that they feel indebted to others, and who is raising those men to treat women as if they're just objects for sexual gratification? Like, that is a real failure of the community. Mm. Um, this, this took place, you know, the, the study that you did over the course of five years, and um, I'm really curious to know about the daily diaries that people, or the diaries that they kept, and what you learned, and how that might have differed from the spoken interviews, um, did that bring out different things to you or different patterns? So the daily diary study, um, it wasn't something that it was, uh, um, it wasn't led by us. Okay. Uh, it was led by Patrick Wilson. And it wasn't, it was a study that was um, surveys that were done every day gotcha. for 60 days. So it followed people, it took a survey one day and it sort of asked about mood, socialization, sleep, substance use, and sexual activity over the last 24 hours, and the next day, and the next day. And it was a research design to try and get at the relationship between these two things in a way that would allow us to establish some degree of causality. But you know, the, the, the kinds of observations that we made in sustained ways allowed us to see the unfolding of people's lives as well over a kind of 18-month period. And so you know, the book is told through um, a lot of it is through the sort of 151 interviews that we did, which were sort of a, a single point in time. We mm -hmm. spent a couple hours with them. For some people, there was so much experience to talk about that we did two further rounds of interviews. But there were also people that we sort of kind of glommed onto, like attached ourselves to a little bit, like not Jennifer and I, but <laughs> members of our research team, <laughs> and followed them around their day-to-day -day lives to see what those lives were like and how they emerged um, over time. And you know, it, it revealed a lot of things to us about the sort of, you know, the, the ways in which life unfolds on campus, that the periods of stress, the extreme periods of stress impact the decisions that our people, people are making. Um, and that kind of rich ethnographic engagement is one of the unique things about the book. Um, there are, some people are more vulnerable than others. There's lots of different reasons why. It can be economic, it can be racial, it can be um, you know, gender-oriented. There's just a lot of different um, uh, you know, keys on that piano. Um, how did you suss those out and fit those into the, uh, this matrix? I mean, it starts with power, right? You can't talk about sexual assault without thinking about power. Um, so I'll tell you a story and then we can talk about it. So Lucy um, started freshman year out of boarding school. She was eager to lose her virginity. She wanted to party and be popular. Um, she met a guy uh, during orientation week in a bar. Uh, he invited her back to his fraternity. She was excited. That felt like the future that she wanted. Um, they stumbled back to the fraternity. He invited her upstairs. She went upstairs with him. They made out. Um, in his room, uh, he started to take off her pants, and she said no to him, no don't, to which he said, it's okay. And then he raped her. And so in some ways that seems like the classic story of what people describe as gender-based violence, right? He's a guy, she's a girl. Um, but he was also several years older than she is in a space that he controls, surrounded by an institution that would support him, where his friends were, familiar on a campus where he's familiar with how people act and what's cool and what's not cool. So there are so many ways, like if you only think about that as gender-based power, you're missing so much of the social power that he deployed in that moment when he ignored her wishes. So there's the complexity, the situational complexity of power, but then we also, uh, there's so many other kinds of inequalities. We were um, powerfully struck by the fact that every single one of the black women that we interviewed described unwanted, non-consensual sexual touching. Were you, you, say, every were you single surprised one. by that? I mean, if you know the history of America, right? right? You, like, have you been to America? So you know that the history of racial domination is from our founding moments tie, is tied to sexual violence. Um, but I think uh, to reconnect, I mean, and in fact, the, anyway, so, so not surprised, but it's a very important and sort of under-discussed part of the story. 
I mean, a, a little bit surprised too because it doesn't appear on national data. Like if you look at nationwide data, you don't sort of see that. But the thing that Jennifer and I came back to again and again is the ways in which, you know, power and precarity were very important for explaining what was happening. So some of the highest rates of assault are experienced by the LGBTQ population. Um, and as much as we can deploy explanations of toxic masculinity for understanding assault, it's really hard to use toxic masculinity to explain why the LGBTQ community has such high rates of assault, because often those assaults are happening within that community, not actually being, it's not, it's not always, in fact, it's rarely the football team that's sort of doing that, if you think of them as like an archetypical example yeah. of, uh, of a form of masculinity. And so we need a broader set of explanations. And part of the point of this book is that sexual assault is not one thing, it's many different things. It's lots of different kinds of experiences that different communities are experiencing for different reasons. And so to address it, we're going to think, have to think about a multi-sectoral approach, ways in which we develop multiple policies, sort of targeted policies that, um, that, that seek to prevent sexual assaults from happening. And undergirding a lot of those policies is going to have to be a commitment to equality, a broad-based commitment to equality that understands that equality is a sexual assault prevention strategy. I mean, to give you an example of um, what the social production of queer students' vulnerability. So uh, one uh, student who goes by uh, uh, Jordan and uses gender neutral pronouns described um, not being after their parents and participating in a summer theater program. They were from the Midwest. Um, and that summer theater program was as they described their first seeing of queerness. And it was also the place where they experienced their first assault. They um, met an older man, uh, they were drunk, the older man was not drunk. And in that moment, it was simultaneously a moment of great vulnerability, but it was the first time they felt seen as someone who didn't fit into the gender binary. So we could do better at that if they had been able to be out to their parents or if they had gone to a school that had a gay straight alliance, right? Like the, the, the experience of feeling invisible, that's our responsibility, we did that, but we could do better at it. You know, we were talking about um, uh, substance, you know, substance use and the relationship of that to all of this and assault. Um, it was really interesting talking with you about that earlier today and uh, how we present in our society uh, or not, you know, any kind of education about that either. And it's sort of this intersection of these two uh, incredibly neglected areas of knowledge. I mean, there's a lot to say, obviously, about substance use and assault. Yeah. Um, you know, but so, so a few important things about it is that, you know, I think we need to talk more explicitly about how substance use puts people at risk for perpetrating sexual assault. Um, so uh, that when people are highly intoxicated, um, they do not have their judgment about them. And they often cannot read the signals, um, and do not respond to the sets of things that are happening around them in a way that they normally would. And this puts them at risk. And I think pivoting the conversation in that way is quite important. Um, I also think it's important to recognize that, you know, in, in the survey that Claude Mellons ran, we we found that you know about 56, 57 percent of the assaults were committed um, through intoxication or some form of inca incapacitation, but that means that like you know more than 40 percent are not, and there are a whole host of assaults that are happening in the context of intimate relationships or non-intimate relationships um, that this intersects with race. Um, so uh, white Americans drink considerably more than Black Americans, and so in all of our attention to intoxicated assaults, one of the things that we, we are sort of inadvertently doing is normalizing the experience of white people um, and not really thinking about the different kinds of assaults that black students experience. And so I think you know we need to remind ourselves why it is that people are drinking in the degrees that they are as part of their sexual encounter. Saying to college students, you can't drink and have sex is such a non-starter from our perspective because people don't like get drunk and then happen to have sex. They often get drunk in order to have sex. And so saying to them, you can't drink and have sex is like saying to them, you can't have sex. And so we need to take a different approach and ask, why is it that people are drinking so much? One young woman said to us, you know, drinking was like Novocaine. 
it allowed her to allow herself to have sex. And there, you could say that the problem is the alcohol, or you could say that part of the problem is the fact that we have created such a high degree of sexual shame within communities that people treat alcohol as Novocaine that allows them to have sex. Um, the, the idea of sex education. Um, I, I, I mentioned this earlier and I have to again. I was, I was startled when I was reading the book and I even went to the notes and double checked it that across uh, party lines, American adults support the institution of sex education K through 12, inappropriate you know, appropriate, you know, I was stunned by that. We're in Ohio where it's the dark ages then because we have literally, we're one of just a couple states that have no policy set forth uh, legal, you know, in statute to provide for sex education. Yeah, and I mean, we found uh, an analysis of the survey data uh, done by my husband, John Santelli, always gotta give John a shout out, um, <laughs> found that uh, women, who had had sex education before college that included um, actual skills building in refusing sex that they didn't want to have, which is not abstinence-only sex education. It's just education that includes a skills building component. Those women were half as likely to be raped in college. So right so, off the bat, you see an, an effect. Right, so like that's, that is as effective as the flu shot, and we want everyone to get a flu shot, right? And so a big message from the book is that we can't get to herd immunity. Um, in sexual assault prevention without making sure that everybody has access to, access to sex ed. Because even if you, know, you as a parent or any one of you as a, as a parent does a great job talking with your kid about sex and preparing them to emerge and to assume their sexual citizenship and acknowledge other people's, they're gonna be around people who have gotten, who, have, who are underprepared. They don't speak the same language. They don't speak the same language. They don't, they don't know how to drive. They're just grabbing the keys and jumping in the car. So we have to, and I think that, you know, yes, parents across the political spectrum um, support comprehensive age-appropriate sexuality education. I think that legislators who have not gotten that message maybe need to get a different job. Mm. And then, you know, when I was reading the introduction to the book or the foreword or whatever you call it, um, uh, you were referencing the physical, uh, you know, what, what, where the furniture is in the room mm. kind of a thing. And I thought, well, they don't exactly literally mean that. <laughs> no, we, we literally mean furniture. I mean, <laughs> Excuse me. We literally mean furniture, and we mean a lot more. Exactly. But yeah, I got into it, and you're absolutely, it's the layout is, is uh, important. Yeah, I mean, the, the concept of sexual geographies is sort of an insight to the ways in which physical space in, affects and even produces certain kinds of interactions. So if we think about the ways in which we're sitting here right now, you guys are all sitting in rows facing us. And so you can't really interact with one another that much. You might be able to interact with the person you're sitting next to, but we are clearly the focus of this conversation. And we could rearrange this space in a different way that had a different kind of sensibility to it. So imagine if we produced this as a circle. Um, if we did that, suddenly we would all kind of see each other and there'd be a different way in which we would interact. That insight about how space produces kinds of interactions allows us a kind of lever for thinking about sexual assault prevention. So, you know, a few examples on this. Um, in residential colleges and universities, there's the naturalization that as students get older, they have access to better space on campus. But one of the consequences of that is that younger students get shuttled into the rooms of older students. And insofar as those older students have, have more power for a wide variety of reasons, that literally empowers them within sexual interactions. Does that cause assault? No, but it certainly lays the groundwork for a range of sexual interactions that can be really problematic. And so we might ask ourselves, why is it that we've organized our community in that way? Or we might think about the ways in which we enforce alcohol policies on, in college dormitories. So if freshmen, are heavily policed in terms of their alcohol consumption, what are they going to do? Well, for those who want to drink, they're going to leave spaces that they control and enter into spaces that other people control. Those spaces, if they're fraternity and sorority life, are always fraternities, because by national rule, fraternities can serve alcohol and sororities can't. And so there, again, the geography of campus and the sets of rules that we have around campus life 
are producing certain kinds of outcomes. This doesn't require an analysis of bad actors or people who are malicious. Instead, it's a sort of an analysis of institutions and systems that have real modifiable uh, consequences to them. We could actually change that built environment in ways that would be safer for people. Jennifer used earlier the example of roads. Well, you know, if people are speeding through your neighborhood, one of the things that you could do is like police that neighborhood all the time. That's really hard. The other thing that you could do is put up a speed bump. And putting up a speed bump, people are gonna start slowing down. And we might need to ask ourselves, what are the sets of things that we could do to our physical and built environment that would lead to safer, safer sets of communities? And so some concrete examples from our work at Columbia. Um, in response to our findings, the person who's responsible for uh, housing and dining has decided to keep one of the cafeterias open all night. Huh. Because if you think about it, like the, the um, organization of space and time funnels drunk people back into bedrooms. And like some of those drunk people might want to go back into bedrooms. But to the extent that those drunk people don't want to go back into bedrooms or are like not really sure if they want to, having a place to stop for french fries is a great sort of population level sexual assault prevention. And our contention is not that the French fries are gonna stop all sexual assaults, but it just create, I mean, uh, not even with onion rings, right? But, <laughs> but, but it just creates a different uh, physical opportunity structure. It's, it, and it's giving people choices. Right, right. I mean, and that is classic, that's what we do in public health. Instead of lecturing people to act better, we change the environment so that they have choices that, that tip them towards safer and less harmful behavior. Um, I don't know, don't forget, Sorry, questions, for, I know, I, I apologize I for going button, toward right? my <laughs> mic when I, when I coughed that time, that was you know, bad planning. Uh, but don't forget to send your questions to the authors. Otherwise, um, we'll just keep going all night. Yeah, we yeah. will, I mean, yeah. This, I, I really hope you will ask questions. Um, and we'd really love to hear from students in the audience um, you know, in particular about their experiences or things that they want, maybe not their experiences, but things that they want to ask us about. Or we, us we had a student call in today on the show and you guys kind of went, wow. Yeah, yeah it's great. Some students listen to the show, you know. <laughs> um, gosh. Um, the responses that you got from the students were so candid and, um, some of the situations that they described to you, at least the ones I read in the book, were some, some of them were really fraught. And I'm wondering, what about your follow-up with some of them and the care um, of talking with them? I, I know this is kind of digressing a little mm -hmm. bit, but I'm, I'm curious about that, how we take care of people. So we, I mean, we actually had a whole emergency protocol in place, we always had a clinician on call and part of our ethics approval was conditional upon um, having a system so that if a student became distraught while they were talking to us, we would be able to refer the, help figure out what they needed and then refer them appropriately. Um, and instead, the by and large, the experience that students seem to have was of laying down a burden with us. Um, it was a little bit, the, the experience of doing the interviews was a little bit like taking the top off a fire hose, like the, this sort of gush of painful stories that students wanted to share with the institution and didn't really have a way to do that without triggering mandated reporting. Um, they all gushed out towards us. And so instead, the um, emergency protocol was more frequently for the interview team, that the interviews were so hard for our staff or for us to hear that we were the ones who, who called a clinician just to, to, um, to debrief and you know, have somebody to cry with. I think it speaks to that, you know, as much as there's a narrative that young people don't want to talk with adults about their sexual experiences, um, many of the people that we spoke to were desperate to have somebody finally listen to them. Um, and you know, some of it was in the hope of institutional transformation, that um, things could change on campus in terms of how we were managing these things. Um, but some of it was really just you know, wanting to feel heard. And um, I think I, you know, one of the big take-homes was that um, there is a need 
to open up these conversations. Uh, uh, and, and that there is a need to start talking with people about what we think sex is for, how it is that we are pursuing that, and how it is that we're treating others as we engage in that pursuit. How do we get away from the you first, <laughs> who's gonna start? Where's it gonna start? Who's gonna do it? Um, kinda. Within a sexual um, interaction, you mean? Or? With talking about it. Oh, with talking about it. I mean, I mean, obviously we're doing it right now, but we're not really talking about it. We're talking, oh, you know, around it in a way, and that's what we're doing today. But, um, I mean, I think that what's needed is to create a structure where students can share the pieces of their experience that they want the institution to know in a way that um, they can control, right? It's very important when you're interacting with survivors to not, um, to, to be respectful of what they want to happen to their story. And all of these stories were stories that, that students share with us because they wanted us to do something with them. And so I think that, that creating a space where people can share their experience without feeling like it's gonna, something's gonna happen that they don't choose. Um, and where the, their goal in sharing the story was not, we're not, we're not clinicians, right? We don't even play them on TV. And mm -hmm. so we were never, the goal was never to um, provide solace, although we tried to be empathetic interviewers, but people came in to tell us their stories because they wanted to be part of making change. I think it's also important to create spaces for people who've had sex in ways that they think maybe they shouldn't have or that they regretted to have a space to express that and to talk about it. And, um, you know, uh, particularly on men, men, there's a huge degree of fear about false accusations. Um, that fear is, in our estimation, as well as most national surveys, like far overblown. It doesn't happen that frequently. But you know, being able to open up and say, I feel like I wasn't my best self in this interaction. I feel like I didn't really carry myself in the way that I wanted to, and leave space for that person to have that conversation and find ways to improve is really important. Um, and that's not really something we have as a set of um, institutional capacities right now. Some people might wonder, what does this have to do with public health. We usually think about, you've used the vaccinations and the flu, the flu shots and that kind of a thing, and, and most people get that, but writ large, you know, how does it figure into public health? I mean, our job in public health is to build a world in which people can thrive, and there is a lot of suffering associated with sexual violence. Um, so this, as a particular outcome, I can't imagine why it wouldn't be part of public health, but also I've spent my whole career thinking about um, sexuality and sexual and reproductive health, and in all of that work, have argued that we can't we can't address these problems one penis at a time, right? We have to think about what population level solutions look like. So it's the application of this op that same optic to this problem, which was largely being addressed, sort of one person at a time, one accusation at a time. Yeah. Well, and I also think that you know understanding that human thriving includes sexuality and sexual expression. So rather than just understanding sort of human thriving as the job that you get and whether or not you're sort of like gainfully employed and you, you know, have a, a good level of cholesterol. I mean, let's begin to open up conversations with people about how sex is going to be an important part of your life. It's going to be a way in which you connect with many people who are very important to you. And you should think about what you want out of that as a way to have a sort of a thriving life. Those conversations are typically not, not encouraged, but typically shut down within families. If we think about the number of conversations that families have about the importance of a career, the importance of what your major selection is, but like what about the importance of interpersonal intimate relationships and what it is that we're doing to practice a set of skills that allow us to be good at those sorts of things. And this is what it means to sort of think about sex and sexuality differently from a kind of human thriving perspective. Did, any, did anyone in the audience, did anyone grow up with sex education in their, in their curriculums? Yeah? Uh, I mean, I remember something vaguely in the fifth grade that scared me and traumatized me, and I still don't know how babies are made. Um, so I, <laughs> but I, but I, you know. I think that, you know, um, a lot of the young people we spoke to had experienced sex ed. 
But what sex ed was, was sexual diseases course and sexual risks okay. course. So it's all about like, you know, people describe being shown pictures of gonorrhea and being like, this is one of the things that's gonna happen to you <laughs> if you have sex. Or, you know, being forced to carry around a five pound bag of flour because this would be the unintended consequences <laughs> of your sex would be like having to carry around this baby all of the time. <laughs> that is a fear-based approach to sex. Right. And, you know, a big part of the project that Jennifer and I are trying to undertake is to not have this conversation founded in fear and to instead have this conversation founded in empathy and hope. So we don't want a sex ed that's based in fear. We want a sex ed that's based in human thriving. Um, we don't want to have conversations about assault that seek to horrify everybody in the audience so that they're just so scared about the future before them for their children or for themselves in college. Instead, we want a kind of different register for the conversations that we're having about sex and sexuality. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that by coming up here, I'm going to encourage other people to to stand up and move up. Yeah, line so, up. Come on, so I've, I mean, I've, I've thought some about fear, and I agree with you there. But as a parent, and as somebody thinking about this from the adult side of the situation, there's this perverse part of me that's wondering: Well, shouldn't parents feel a little bit of fear about their kids not having a full range of sex, knowing how babies are made, and only knowing how babies are made? I think people, parents, are afraid of their kids uh, experiencing assault or being accused of assault or inadvertently or vertently committing assault. Um, is there, is there a, a degree to which we could ex to, to maybe exploit parents' fears to say that, in fact, there's a, there are a whole range of things that you can help your children not experience? Because we don't want our children to experience that pain and suffering. You have been talking about pain and suffering. And that, that motivates parents to want something different for their kids. And as I hear that as a parent, there is part of me that that triggers fear in. And I don't, I don't see that as a, I don't see that as a bad thing. I see that as a, let me, let me experience in my gut something that's going to make me perhaps be different as a, as a parent, have a different kind of conversation as a parent. I think that if, if fear is the seed or the spur to action um, and to thinking about what you can do differently, then that's great. I mean, but I think about when my son left the house for his first driver's ed class, I said to him, don't crash. <laughs> and like, that was really not a useful message, right? All it <laughs> conveyed to him was that I thought he was going to be a terrible driver, right? And that is sort of, which he hasn't crashed yet, but so that, that is the equivalent for, for many parents of the message they give their kids around sex, that they, from a place of fear is don't get pregnant, don't get anyone pregnant. And so now added on to that is don't rape anyone, don't get raped. And we, so we need to do better. And I think that doing better means acknowledging our kids' sexual citizenship, acknowledging that you know, from the moment they learn to kick the swing by themselves, they're responsible for their own bodies. They're gonna sometimes make decisions about what they do with those bodies that are not the decisions that we would want them to make. And it's our job to help them move through the world without harming other people. So I think that, yeah, fear is fine if it helps people take responsibility and spur them to action, but if it's just the fear, then that's not useful. Um, I teach a class kind of on this topic, family development, which I think should be required of every student at Ohio State because we yes. talk about these topics. But, um, and I ask my students to do what their perfect partner looks like, and they always forget to write down anything about sex. I'm like, are we looking for best friends here? Or are we looking for people we're going to have sex with? <laughs> so they don't even like think about that. But what I wanted to ask a question about was about religion. And you mentioned that you're going to religious spaces. And I think that our messages coming from religion is so problematic about sex, especially for women. And I just wanted you to talk more about that. Um, there are a lot of different religions in America and a broad diversity of messages uh, around sex. If, um, but I think that a commonality of religion is that the point of it is to teach people how to be good humans in the world, right? And so there it, it are nuggets of teaching about what people owe each other and human dignity and respect that could serve as the basis for religious institutions to step up and be part of the solution. I mean, it's a very low bar to think about faith-based institutions as being places where kids aren't assaulted, 
right? Like that should be something that is expected of every religious institution. But I've, as a as a parent, had the experience of seeing my kids um, at our temple participate in a program for young people where they talk with other adults about religious values and intimacy and gender. And it was really, really powerful in part because, I mean, I'm such an awesome mom, so of course they want to talk to me <laughs> about these things. But to have, I think kids need other grownups in their lives who are not their parents. Where they, and so to have that faith-based space where they can think about intimacy and holiness and, and articulate with peers what a goal would be for a respectful relationship. I think that, that is potentially such a powerful experience. And from the point of view of religious institutions, they want to keep the kids in, right? And like potentially even dating each other. So it's, there's an appeal for the institutions themselves. They're, they're missing a big marketing um, <laughs> opportunity by not going deeper in this. So, so like not every congregation is the Unitarian Universalist Church. But I think that every congregation needs to think, how can they be part of the solution on this? So I'm raising three boys and um, thinking about this often, teenager on it down to seven years old. And I've been talking to them since they were little, like us bathing them about their bodies and about other people's bodies. And I'm pretty matter of fact about all the parts. I'm really matter of fact about um, I'm probably a little too graphic, but I mean, you know, I'm just really having honest conversations with them to the point where now that they're a little older, they're like, oh, mom, we got to talk about this again. I I'm just curious. I just want to be honest with them, and I want, I'm the only girl in the house, and I just need them to sort of understand. I, I just want to keep talking to them about this. I feel like we could never stop talking about this, but I'm just curious in your research if you've encountered people who have had conversations, like like what you what you've heard about where how young or where it starts or if that's effective or you know how much is too much, and I'm not having these scary conversations. I'm just having pretty matter of fact conversations, even as they interact their bodies with each other, like respecting boundaries, consent. Like if if your brother says don't sit on him, you know that kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Like you know, or like keep your hands out of his face, you know that kind of thing. But just get, that kind of agency. So just curious for you to talk about some of that. Either you're, one. you're awesome. Everyone, be like her. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think that in the research that we did, it was so striking. Um, having a, 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 an open, converse, uh, communicative uh, converse, uh, sort of relationship with your parent around sexuality isn't going to be 100% protective against experiences of sexual assault. But the kids who had spoken with their parents knew that they could turn to them when something went wrong. And that the, the solace that parents provided, that emotional support, and it was always the moms. So like, yeah, and I, was I think say, so I was dads- I say, it's not the parents. Right, okay, so dads <laughs> step up a little bit in doing this emotional labor. But so I think that, that you're, you're laying, you can't 100% protect your kid when they go out in the world, but you can let them know that you will never judge them for what happens and that you will always be there for them. So that is so important. And I think there is a ton of work on um, outside of the research that we did about the importance of parent-child communication around healthy sexuality. So you're laying the groundwork for them to go out into the world and, and be decent men. You mentioned, um, you told the story about one woman, and we might have already talked about her or not, because I'm conflating some of them now, but um, she said she was one of the lucky ones, that she had gone through trauma, had been assaulted, but at least she could call her mom and and tell her about it, talk to her mom about it. And yeah, she said, thank God it happened to me. Yeah. And she, she didn't mean that, that she was glad that she had been raped. Um, what she meant was that among the people, her community of people, she knew she could talk to her mom about it. She knew that her mom wouldn't judge her for, you know, being in a sexual situation um, for, and wouldn't, wouldn't, like would be able to listen to her. And so, you know, in terms of parents who had opened up that space for their kids, it really did, in, in, our, in our work, it did make kids more able to sort of weather the difficult experiences that they've had because they knew that there was a parent there that they could talk to. And actually, it's not a parent, it's a mom. I think 
I, I don't I don't know that this is totally accurate, but I would say a hundred percent of the time it was moms. I mean, Except in the movies, there's always some sensitive dad out there. Yeah, somewhere. but I mean, it, it it was pretty. People always talked about talking to their mom about this, and it does convey the degree to which men have to step up um, who are in parenting roles in the work that they're doing. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the book in political context. So I know you began the work in 2015, um, but we're living in an era now, particularly with Me Too, where there's public accusations, public trials, but a lot of public support for people coming forward to tell their story of assault, and some of them are extremely straightforward and clear-cut, and some of them are ambiguous, right? And we're having a very public discussion about those. But we also have very public evisceration of some women who come forward and tell stories, and so very clear um, pushback on those people and, and on their lives and on their own futures when they decide to come forward. And so how has that made the work of studying this or reporting about it or proposing solutions for it kind of more complicated? Um, I don't know that it's made it more complicated. It's to me underlines the urgency of moving upstream and thinking about prevention. I think that the, the moment we're in politically illustrates that we can't punish and adjudicate our way out of this. And certainly there are circumstances in which punishment and adjudication is the appropriate path forward, but we could do, still, even in this Me Too moment, the conversation, the emphasis is on afterwards. And we're like, how about we just avert a lot of this suffering? So I think that really we, what we're, our connection to Me Too is that there hasn't really been a formulation of a Me Too policy agenda yet, and no matter how many workplace trainings people click through those PowerPoints, that's not gonna transform their behavior. And so thinking, again, about comprehensive sex education, which does not exist in the state of Ohio, and doesn't exist in many states across the country, and you know, leaving here and calling your legislators and being like, when are you gonna provide this thing that would pr protect a lot of people in this state from, from sexual assault? I feel like that's, that's the connection that we wanna make. First of all, thank you for this incredible panel. And um, uh, so I'm a faculty member in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and we're also obviously very concerned about the topic, and we're very concerned also about institutional responses to assault on campus. And um, so the question I had, and I think um, it has a lot to do with institutional response, is how do you feel about mandated reporting from the perspective of, you know, I think of it as from the perspective of, as a faculty member, sometimes I have a student who says, I missed the midterm because I was assaulted. And they don't necessarily want me to share it with an institutional figure in the university. They just wanna let me know why they couldn't possibly do the midterm. Or, you know, things like that, and so I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm conflicted myself. So I was wondering what you think in terms of you know, campus climate and campus response to assault. So for those who are unfamiliar with what mandated reporting is, um, it is uh, institutional interpretation of um, a set of federal guidelines that were laid out by the Obama administration in a Dear Colleague letter, um, which said that there was a responsibility for educational institutions to transform how it was that they were addressing sexual assault. And part of that responsibility was um, that if, uh, if young people were reporting experiences of assault uh, to someone who they had a reasonable expectation that that person was in a position to do something about it, that person had a responsibility to report. And um, in most educational institutions across the country, that has meant that professors um, are mandated reporters. For the purposes of our research, we were exempt from mandatory reporting. So one of the ways in which we were able to gather the data we were able to gather was that we could promise people that even if they told us their stories, we were not obligated to report it to the university. You know, there are lots of good reasons for mandata mand mandated reporting. Um, uh, uh, which is that if people are experiencing harm, they need to be put in touch with or they, they should be made aware of the range of resources that are available to them. And so the impetus to this is to make sure that like, as people experience that, those harms, they know the sets of things that the institution can and will do um, in, in order to help them. The, 
one of the challenges is that that often simultaneously triggers investigations. Um, and that is not always something that people want. And so um, uh, I think that one of the reasons why Jennifer and I were able to get so many people to talk to us about their experiences was that the, that the wide knowledge of mandatory reporting had meant that there was a little bit of a bottleneck of people holding in experiences that they wish they'd had the capacity to talk with someone about. And it wasn't necessarily that they wanted to talk to a counselor, but it was somebody. Um, you know, I have share, I think, your conflictual feelings about this, that um, it's really important for people when they reach out to be given access to the sets of supports that they need. Um, and it's not always easy for people to identify those reports. Um, at the same time, given that most people are assaulted by someone that they know, uh, often by someone that they've previously had sexual contact with, initiating investigations puts an enormous amount of tension, like weight, tension, and friction within social groups, which is something that people really want to avoid. I mean, the other thing I would add is just that we, we are social scientists and we are, the goal in our research was really not to evaluate in any way the adjudication processes at Columbia. It was really to look upstream and think about um, what we can do to prevent it. So a little bit, when I get a question like that, I always wanna stay in our lane and be like, our, we're looking upstream towards how we can prevent these things and I think that there, there are other people who have a lot to say about mandated yeah. reporting. Yeah. And smarter things to say, yeah. I don't even play a lawyer on TV. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. My name is Shaisa. I just wanted to say I like your socks. Oh, thank you. Go off stripes. Um, I'm a women's gender sexuality studies major at OSU, and my focus has been primarily on the black female flesh. Um, and so I was just curious what research you guys have done with the inclusion of the black female because the percentages of sexual assault obviously are higher within marginalized bodies. Um, and women of color, uh, speaking from experience, have trouble reporting and speaking to anyone about being assaulted or abused because it is very um, taboo, sort of, to talk about traumas of that nature. Um, so I was curious if you guys were able to include the black body in your conversation or in your research. Um, so yeah, I mean, go, go ahead. No, sure. yeah. um, so the, you know, the, the, the way in which we wrote this book is deeply intersectional. So thinking about um, the ways in which gender matter, but also gender in relationship to class and in relationship to race. Um, as Jennifer said earlier, I think, um, every single uh, black woman that we spoke to told us a story of unwanted sexualized touching. Uh, black men told us similar stories. So one black man we spoke to uh, opined that you know uh, white women's sort of freedom at walking up to him at a bar and grabbing his penis uh, reflected just a fundamental disrespect for his corporeal autonomy and a kind of white fascination with black penises. And you know again and again we saw the ways in which racial inequality was really important to what was happening. Um, one of the young women that we spoke to, um, her, we give her the name Charisma in the book. Um, you know, she experienced campus life as a white space. Um, and, you know, this led to all kinds of things. So she didn't really want to go to frat parties where she was like, I don't like the music, you know, too many people are drinking, and the men who are there are not really into me anyway. And what ended up happening with her was that she sort of connected with this guy through her roommate and began texting back and forth with him and eventually went out to his apartment in Brooklyn. Um, and you know it was kind of a terrible night that it was pouring rain. She got soaked to the bone. The subway stopped running, and you know she got there. They smoked a little. Um, they started to make out, and eventually he ended up assaulting her. And you know w one of the ways in which we think about an analysis of that story is through the perspective of race and class. Because when she got to his apartment, she was a little uncomfortable about what was happening, but she couldn't afford the sixty dollars. It was gonna to be to open up her phone, grab an Uber back to campus. Yeah. The subway was shut down. She wasn't really sure how to get a bus back. It was gonna take a couple hours. And so that financial cost really mattered. But we also can't explain why it is that she was out in that apartment in the first place without thinking about why it was that she experienced the institution as a white institution. 
in her language and the ways in which that drove her out of the spaces on campus into other places and exposed her to some degree of vulnerability. And so for us, again and again and again in the book, we don't really have a, you know, often there would be sort of a chapter on gender, a chapter on sexuality, a chapter on race. And throughout the book, we try to integrate stories um, that, that draw upon people of different racial and ethnic identities and to highlight the ways in which an analysis that really thinks about power uh, as a central lens and power working at, at many levels is essential to understanding sexual assault. Yeah. So you guys said you speak in it, or you work in an intersectional way as well. So did you guys also include people who don't identify with the gender? Um, in terms of, yes. So uh, we looked at people with a, a range of gender identities. So gender queer people, um, and part of the, uh, their experiences was also an exposure to vulnerability for a wide variety of reasons. Um, and within those situations, you know, we spoke to one person, uh, they used the pronouns they. Um, they were in a sexual relationship with somebody and in a dating relationship. And at the time they were really, um, uh, they were having mental health struggles and they, they did, weren't really, they didn't really have a very high sex drive. And the other person that they were with also identified as genderqueer and um, would say to them, you know, oh, you don't find me attractive. Oh, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't really like me. And, you know, basically exploit uh, the way in which this person knew what it was like to have your gender question, your beauty question, um, your physical body question, in order to kind of extract sex. And this person consented to sex in those situations, but we would say under duress. And in those instances, it's very hard to make sense of that story. Um, that story of uh, these two genderqueer pe people without thinking about the ways in which, you know, the precarious experience of being such a person in the world um, really put them at risk. And part of our analysis there is that you don't have to have power to use power. Mm. Um, that, you know, power is not just something that like, particular people have, but it's often things that people deploy. And as an intervention, one of the things that Jennifer and I speak to a bunch of the times is educating people about the ways in which they often use power to get the things that they want, or are unwittingly empowered, not because of necessarily things that they're doing, but because of positions that they're in, and how that might lead people to agree to things that they don't really want to agree to because they're in a disempowered position. And I think in the book, we also, we apply that same intersectional lens um, about power to thinking about whiteness and masculinity, right? I mean, if you go back to the, the story about Lucy and Scott, you might, you know, when you hear that story, you could think maybe he's a terrible person, right? And that doesn't necessarily advance our prevention agenda to judge him as a human being. And so I think helping um, people who are in more socially advantaged uh, uh, positions recognize how whiteness, how masculinity, how wealth, how being an upperclassman, how controlling space, how all of those things can put them in a position where their partner is literally silenced. And so he might, Scott may have had no idea. Well, I mean, she said no. So actually in that, like he also, there's a brokenness there. Um, so I think he needs to be held responsible for that. But um, we tell other stories in the book where it really seems like the person doing the assault may have had no idea that what they were doing was there's, an assault. There's another story that you talked about earlier today um, about a guy who, he's gay and um, he has a partner and he stays with the partner because of, to avoid the risks. Oh, um, Adam, yeah. Adam. I mean, and, and, I, and I was thinking about this earlier. It, well, you can tell the story, but I also was thinking about from the point of view of his partner, what they're thinking, is that normal? And they don't know because he never says anything. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, Adam was a young man that we spoke to who was uh, gay, who was from a fairly conservative background in the Midwest, and um, who uh, really valued being in a relationship. So for him, uh, you know, we, we use this phrase, a sexual, the sexual project, um, or sexual projects within the work, and it's really an answer to 
what is sex for? And one of the ideas in the book is that sex is for lots of things. Sometimes it's for pleasure, but other times, you know, sex is to help sustain relationships, that people have sex within relationships because the relationships are valuable to them. And so Adam, you know, uh, sex was really important to him as a way to sustain a relationship because he didn't really want to be part of what he saw as, you know, the dominant hookup scene among gay men in New York City. And um, he described an evening where, well, he described that his boyfriend in general was forceful about sex, but that his boyfriend came home one evening pretty drunk and in Adam's word, he basically raped me. And Adam didn't really want to talk about this with his friends because he really, you know, I don't know if he used the word love with his boyfriend, but he was like deeply attached to his boyfriend and deeply attached to the relationship that they were in. And so it was something that he kind of endured because of what he saw as the thing that was most valuable to him, which was sustaining this kind of relationship. And I'm thinking about the boyfriend and how it becomes normalized for him. It's just, it's, there's a whole other side to that. Yeah, I mean, it's very hard for us. We, you know, it's important to remember that in our, in the work that we do, in almost every instance, we only have one person's account right. of an interaction. So it's hard for us to sort of impute motive to the boyfriend, mm -hmm. other than to say, you know, one, as I said before, the boyfriend in that instance was very drunk and may not have been fully aware of what he was doing. We don't know, maybe he was aware, but that um, excessive alcohol consumption can put you at risk of committing an assault. And secondly, you know, that often among men, um, you know, sex is something to have or to get. Uh, that the sexual projects that men have are often about their own sexual pleasure and not always thinking about the sets of things that their partners are experiencing. And we don't, again, know what Adam's boyfriend was thinking or doing in that scenario, but it strikes me as not unreasonable to assume that that was one of the things that was happening there. And, and so just to expand, are we stopping? Oh, no. Okay. Go ahead. So just to expand a little bit, is in the book we, we lay out this idea of a sexual project, that people have sex for different reasons, and, and um, we provide illustrations of students who have sex to gain status or for pleasure or just to accrue experience or to like get it over with, losing their virginity. And we try, I mean, as a mom, I am judgy about sexual projects, but as a researcher, I think our goal was to, to not be judgy, right? But just to like learn what the range of sexual projects is. And we certainly observed that um, sexual projects that involve accumulating a lot of experience or having sex to impress your friends um, are more likely to be associated with treating the other person like an object. And that is more likely to be associated with, with assaulting them. And so it's not that there is a better or a worse sexual project. That really is for people to decide themselves. But um, I think the big take home for students is that it's important to remember that the people that they're having sex with are people. Right? So regardless of what their sexual project is, there's another person in there. It's not a sex toy. It's not just it's not the orgasmatron. It's not just there for your entertainment. And so they should also be regarded as a self-determining person. So we're going to take two more questions from the audience, and then I think you all are going to be in the back of the room again for a Sign bit. all the books. OK, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Hirsch, you had mentioned earlier that for young women who had been given some skill building around rejecting sexual advances in their sex ed, their likelihood of experiencing assault had gone down by about half. I was wondering if there was anything that came up in your research um, that happened on the flip side, being um, responding to being rejected um, and how that had impacted anything. And if so, could you share with us a little bit about that? And if not, would you feel comfortable kind of extrapolating and seeing and talking to us about what might be helpful? I think that the the danger of that emphasis on refusal skills training is that it can put the burden of prevention on people who are assaulted, which is not what we want to be doing. Um, in other work that I've done, I've mapped out how sex education makes sense as a strategy to reduce perpetration. So it's it's a harder thing to assess empirically because the rates of acknowledging that you perpetrated sexual assault are much lower on, in survey research, so I feel like there are some measurement challenges there, but we're just waiting for the right research design and enough funding. I'm very sure that 
good, comprehensive K-12 sex education. I'm not going, I'm going out on a limb here. I mean, so yes, I'm very sure that it is effective as, as um, uh, perpetration reduction, but we don't have the data yet. But let's get the data, right? Yeah, I mean, not just refusal skills, but listening skills as, as an alternate way. Um, hi, my name is Jill Davis. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm a first year doctoral student in the public policy school, but I was the campus prevention coordinator here at Ohio State doing sexual violence prevention in one capacity or another for the last five years. And what I'm interested in asking you is, in your conversations with men, what were ways in which you could engage, what are ways that you think that we can engage men in meaningful ways and in like large impactful ways? Um, and I ask that just because that's been a huge struggle, even though there have been baby steps forward, but it does feel like there's a, a strong backlash. Um, some conversations I've had with male professors were recently were along the lines of like, I know you're studying sexual harassment, but you have no idea what it's like to be a dude. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't, that's true. Um, they ask what they meant by that? I, I'm just curious. Like, the fear of being falsely accused. Okay. Um, I, you know, and one professor was like, oh, I was gonna say something, and he tapped me on the knee, and then he sat on his hands. And I was a little bit like, I was like, that's a, like, you're okay. You know, so mm -hmm. there's, I, I feel like I'm maybe, because of what I studied, I'm feared. <laughs> so I guess I'm interested in just what are ways to engage men in meaningful ways, because I don't think men are, I, I think men genuinely are interested in, in being good and, and creating a community that's safe and they don't want to be perpetrators. Well, I kinda, know, so. I'm thinking and I'm visualizing some of the strategies I hear about where they go to the fraternities and they sit in groups of guys and try to talk about it and nobody says anything because who's going to say anything kind of a thing. I mean, I'm wondering about that too. Well, how do you engage? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's much, it's, it, it needs to be much broader than sort of just identifying the few places like, you know, fraternities. It's, you know, it's important to note that in our, in the survey work that we did, um, you know, we found that fraternity members, men, were more likely to be victims of assault. Um, uh, but there, is, there isn't the, the evidence on fraternity members' perpetration is mixed. Some studies find that they're more likely to commit assaults. Some find that they're not more likely to commit assaults. Um, I think we do need to open up this conversation about, you know, accusation and fear. And, um, you know, in the book, we talk about the ways in which uh, it's very difficult to have conversations about uh, problematic sexual encounters that someone may not have experienced as assault, but they may have experienced as a problem, um, when there's this imagination that an accusation will ruin your life. Um, you know, now whether or not an accusation actually ruins your life is an empirical question, and there are people who are working on that right now. Um, some people are challenging the idea that it does at all. But often that what this does is it pits people in very oppositional positions. So like if you imagine that an accusation is going to ruin your life, the immediate response is to deny. And so this opens up a series of questions about what are the institutional uh, structures that we could have that would allow for conversations about that um, where men and also women uh, were able to be given feedback about how others experienced problematic sex with them. Um, and where, you know, we, this was sort of a very tender, like, uh, recommendation, um, and I'm not sure it would work. It was sort of a thought piece in the, in the book, but one of the things we, we, we suggested was, like, maybe we should consider having spaces where there could be non-punitive response to some forms of reporting so that people could get feedback about the ways in which others had experienced sex with them in ways that didn't necessarily create the degree of silence that we have now where people often are choosing not to report. It's important also to recognize that like among partners, um, and, and you know, we, we have these examples in the book where you know, if we take Adam, for example, why doesn't Adam want to report on his boyfriend? Well, part of it is that he really likes his boyfriend, but the other is that like, he's suddenly putting an enormously polluting identity onto his boyfriend if he says he raped me because it transforms his boyfriend into a sociopath, into a rapist. And so I think we need to expand our descriptive language and understanding of what's happening. I mean, I th at the bottom of it, there are a lot of people who are just very bad at sex. 
right? And I think that they would probably like to not be bad at sex. And so um, whatever is, gonna, is required to help people be more attentive, sensitive, skillful sexual partners, like in public health, we have won when we've um, presented something to aspire to, right? So like that's how we, that is part of the, the win around condom use is eroticizing condom use. And so I think thinking about um, structures and spaces and institutions that could help people, and I think in particular men, be less bad at sex. Did you have one, did, did you have one last question? Should we add a, did you have one last question? Yeah, do you mind? Hi, I'm also an undergrad WGSS student, and I was wondering, I hadn't had the chance to read the whole book, but from the parts I read, I noticed there wasn't really talk about disabled students. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if this is something that came up in your research a lot, especially because not only for sexual spaces, but for non-sexual spaces, there is a huge issue with non-consensual encounters and touching. I'm so glad you asked that question. I feel like what we do in the book is raise a series of questions, and then there's some, some doors that we open for other people to walk through and lead on, and that is certainly um, not something that we ex examine uh, in, in depth in the book, and I feel like that's, we would love to have people build on our work by examining that because uh, people who are disabled, and women in particular, do have m much higher rates of being sexually assaulted, and so um, I'm grateful to you for calling attention to that question, and I hope that there is someone in this room who will you know, build on the work that we've done. Thank you so much. You've been a lovely uh, audience, and we appreciate it. Thanks to both of you for all the work you've done and sharing your insights with us today. I appreciate it. Great, and thanks to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.